Good evening, everybody. How are you all tonight on this beautiful winter night? This is a picture of Franz Boas. Um, he is the father of anthropology as we know it today. And it is really sort of almost more of a form of social engineering um, than, than anything else. And um, there have been some books that have been written about this kind of over the years of people who really felt that, you know, they didn't trust Franz, you know, where was Franz coming from? He looks all kind of fun and wild and sort of pretty hippie there on the outside, but what was Franz up to on the inside? And what I'm going to talk about may or may not be controversial, may or may not be true, but we're going to just be looking at some interesting um, people, facilities, institutes in history that may have had an influence on our culture and maybe not for the best. We'll see. Maybe. Um, Franz Boas, um, I kind of like to think of him maybe as the Wizard of Oz behind his little Dorothy who was Margaret Mead and he just sort of plucked her out as a grad student or undergrad who was someone who just you know was was rather pliable you know rather um, uh, willing to kind of go along with his um, his kind of plan so she um, probably as most know, although who knows what they teach in school anymore, but she was really celebrated as this just huge, you know, um, cultural icon, you know, uh, replacing saints um, as this uh, person that really knew what was going on. And here, I think here's a little picture of her book, um, The Coming of Age in Samoa. And it later became just hugely discredited that um, everything was a um, a lie. So here it's called a psychological study of primitive youth for Western civilization. And this was where things were sort of interesting with our little um, Franz Boas here. And this is a kind of a difficult <laughs> situation here where I think before Franz Boas you looked at different um, cultures according to their development and some of that may have been you know elitist but uh, you know if you look at a culture um, that's just maybe using Stone Age tools um, and then you look at maybe another culture that is um, going to the moon, you know, that there is there is a sort of a, a difference there um, in, in cultures. And so a di differentiation of development for, you know, myriads of reasons. So Franz Boas came along, our little kind of pre-hippie guy here. Doesn't he look like someone who just kind of took acid and is about to fly? Um said, guess what, all, we can all learn from each other, which I think is very true in a lot of ways, but he was really doing this in a way um, that was more sinister than this kind of let's all love everybody. It was um, a sort of way to mock Western civilization, you know, to take it down a few pegs and to say oh, you know, you think you're so developed, you know, you, you have rockets and everything, but Samoa is just the same. And it basically kind of created a confusion among cultures that, you know, suddenly everyone is expected to be the same when they've all come from totally different backgrounds and everything. And this was part of a 
kind of a hatred of the West that um, that occurred um, really with a movement um, that was called the um, the the Frankist uh, movement, and this this person was somebody who was really great that I was um, listening to earlier, and he talks about new left Marxism and the Frankfurt School, um, and he. I'll leave a link because this this was a really excellent talk to um to hear. The Frankfurt School was cultural Marxism, which was really out to destroy Western civilization. I'm not totally sure as to why. I don't know if there was a just kind of a power um, struggle involved where one group wanted to dominate another. I don't know if there was jealousy um, because a lot of this uh, postmodernism came from this. And so a lot of maybe talented classical music got replaced with just sort of discordant things. You know, somebody throws feces at the wall uh, and they're considered a great artist. Uh, so the Frankfurt, um, school, uh, that was where it was, and weirdly the person's name was Frank, one of the people, um, they were out to just be subversive. And one thing that they did that was uh, pretty intense, and we'll come back to this because that actually is, I think, Theodore Adorno, who was kind of important in all of this. Um, but the Frankfurt School got actually tossed out of Europe and they ended up coming over to the US and to New York, and they're still there to this day. And here they are in their many different um, lives, the New School. And the New School was basically a PhD factory. In fact, it's funny because I did have um, a person that I proofread with who got a PhD there. It was known as a PhD factory, really easy to get one. You could go from having an undergrad degree to having a kind of graduate degree with a PhD kind of just um, tacked on. Here's art classes. I've got another friend whose dad went there and he was in the um, the Planet of the Apes and different things. I went to school with Maud, if anyone remembers the woman who played Maud in the Archie Bunker series and then was later on the Golden Girls and she was part of that too. But they were basically a PhD factory where they were giving themselves degrees and then fanning out all across the US post-World War II um, with all these little, you know, PhD people getting jobs at all the universities across the U.S. And it's interesting because this was the time of Joseph McCarthy, and he was sort of barking up the wrong tree. He was kind of, you know, going after, um, you know, what was he going after? He was going after, like, Hollywood people and not realizing really the the um, infiltration, the marination um, that occurred in our in our schools. And there's some just real classic examples even here in our town at Evergreen of um, people who are <clears throat> teaching there who are from that. So it was called the New School for Social Research. And that in itself is a creepy name. I had never really thought of it before. Here we've got our little sexual subversion of America. And, um, you know, these are the people that were just really out to subvert anything and everything that was, um, that was sacred and that held a culture together. You know, they wanted a generation gap between the old and the young. They wanted a gap between women and men you know, just between so many things. And yet to also mix everything up 
and say everything is the same at the same time. It's just a very weird, um, and we'll get into also the Fabian Society. So here's H. Uh, G. Wells um, talking about how um, world socialism is is scientifically planned. Okay, and this this is another really good um, YouTube, the Fabian Society exposed a wolf in sheep's clothing, and there are several really good ones out there. And when it's called a wolf in sheep's clothing, that is not just a sort of a you know, a little uh, joke. That was actually the mascot of the Fabian Society. And their house where they all met um, is still intact in England. And there's a stained glass window with this like evil looking wolf in the stained glass coming out of sheep's clothing. So, you know, they, they let us know um, as well in plain sight. And from there, really, were, were born um, a myriad of things. And one of them that is interesting because it kind of blends cultural anthropology with pop culture. And it will kind of lead us back, I think, to John Todd, the Illuminati, and then the Laurel Canyon people. And I don't know if this has been on anyone's radar or not but it's the Tavistock Institute, and that is in London. Uh, here's, here's a little, it's a very secretive place, but here's a little um, picture of the front of it, and this is the Tavistock Institute, social, social engineering, very, very super secretive, really top, um, you know, deep, deep state spies, you know, and you can see here how it's all kind of connected in. You see Wall Street there, the Rand Corporation, um, just, you know, all of these uh, tentacles of the Tavistock Institute. And I think, you know, like when you look at their goal, one of their goals was how do you reduce a population? as if they have lost a war. How do you get them in that frame of mind without having to drop a bomb? Without them even knowing that a war is being fought. How do you do that? And, you know, you do that with, you know, I, I guess it would be called a soft war. Yeah, I'm sure there are many terms for it. And you know, this is, this is kind of maybe, you know, getting out there. Um, we'll get back to this in a minute, but, um, some feel that the Beatles themselves were like part of it, you know, that they, um, were part of this social engineering plan to, um, to come in and to change the way that people think, the way that people are, to bring about a generation gap, to drop a sort of mental hydrogen bomb and to um, create um, the 60s, as it were. So this, you know, this is interesting. And one of the people who is really good to kind of study or look into is Theodore Adorno, and he came from Germany originally, and he studied music and psychology in an incredibly deep way, and there are papers that I've had of his around that were really quite amazing. He later called himself a cultural industrialist, and he was doing experiments with uh, music and with children and with the mind, and it creeped, it creeped out whoever it was in the government, what he was doing. He was definitely on to something, but it creeped everyone out that he was um, just doing these weird music things with children. And he literally got tossed out and went from there to the Tavistock Institute. You know, and I remember having a friend who said, you know, how can you say he's evil when he just stumbled upon something, you know, saying you know, music can make you stupid, or, you know, if you, if you listen to, um, five minutes of, 
um, something really blue, and then you listen to another five minutes of something really happy, um, that this can create a sort of internal schizophrenia within people, basically dumbing down. And this, you know, Adorno has been credited with being the father of, after leaving Tavistock, he came to the U.S. and was with the Rockefeller Institute and designed the whole AM formula, AM music formula, where, you know, if um, music is under, you know, three minutes long and is blah, blah, you know, that it keeps people at a certain level of, um, of stupidity really um you know how can we have authenticness and uh, and, uh, and an authentic life when the background is nothing but cheesy music soap operas he also had a hand in creating you know just really dumbing down stuff you know the music of people so um you know he he is slightly a bit of a villain um in that way and then he did eventually go to Hollywood. So he had his fingers in many, many pies. And here, this this kind of fits in um, in a strange way. These are the Venona papers, and I'm always kind of like forgetting to mention them or look into them enough. There is a book about the Venona um, secrets, and this is, um, these are papers from the Soviet Union that were discovered, um, you know, and they were from the 40s, really showing the level, uh, the deep level of infiltration of cultural Marxism into the U.S. and how little we really did know how much it was happening, just thousands upon thousands of people. I think we just thought, oh, you know, there's just a few here and, here and there. And these papers really show that um, that there really was this deep infiltration of cultural Marxism. And like I said, they came, they came from the Franca school. They gave everyone a PhD from that Franca's little factory. And then they um, just went on from there. And once again, if you don't know there's a war being fought against you, how do you defend yourself? And if the Tavistock Institute was, you know, able to figure out that, you know, with a certain uh, beats, uh, certain colors, uh, certain drugs, you know, that um, if they could mix us all up, they could really create um, a sort of mincemeat of the brain. It freaks me out. I, I had worked at Sullivan and Cromwell, and um, the Dulles brothers were definitely part of the social engineering. And I remember um, reading something where Alan Dulles had written about really wanting to push communes in the 60s because it was an instant spy network and you could just really turn someone's brain to mush really, really easily by having them live in that way. And so it's weird. It's funny when you see how you've been played to in these things. You know, I grew up on the West Coast a little bit here, and, uh, you know, I didn't know that the commune itself was part of this social engineering, a sort of a little big brothery thing, as it were. So we will end this with, um, with wonderful Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Freud, and... Here's one of his little sayings, propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. And he was the person who, who first realized that you could um, have subliminal uh, popcorn in a movie, put Coke ads in the middle, make everybody thirsty, make everyone want this or that. And they also he went from there to being an advisor to um, presidents and things like that. So he was an ad man and he was a presidential advisor. So um, we will end on that note. Um, these are kind of uh, wild conspiracies out there, but we're going to just 
look at the people behind them and really just look at these institutes and kind of just try to see for ourselves. So I'm just throwing a few things out here tonight and I hope that you are all doing most well. Take really, really, really good care and good night.